So the plan for Nigel Farage and reform is not just uh, to win a seat, not just to win uh, the seat that Nigel Farage is running in, not just to win maybe a handful of seats, but actually to become the official opposition to a Labour government. Benedict, very good morning to you. Good morning. How are you? Mike? Yeah, very well indeed. Good to talk to you. I mean, fascinating, isn't it? The way that the sort of reform machine is 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 rolling out. It's uh, despite uh, accusations of of sort of you know fantasy economics and all of that kind of thing from from politicians and economists who say, well, their manifesto couldn't possibly work. You know, they never say that about anybody else's manifesto, which also quite often can't possibly work. Um, mm. But they've been quite clever with their campaign, aren't they? I think they have. And I think it's all the more impressive, actually, given that one of the, one of the big sort of um, hopes that a lot of conservatives had was, oh, well, reform might be very popular and we might be very unpopular, but reform have got no ground game. They don't mm. have an, a sort of an established team of people who can sort of uh, go out and spread the message. And that's ultimately where we're going to beat them. And it sort of looks like that won't even uh, remotely matter to right. get the message out there. I think everybody's well aware what the core messages are of reforms. Um, uh, uh, manifesto. And I mean, as you say, it's, it, I mean, people are sort of calling it a, a fantasy manifesto, but whose isn't ultimately? Right. And if you're the Labour Party or the Conservatives, and to be honest, there's elements of fantasy even about theirs. Minor parties can promise you the earth because they know that they're never actually going to have to see it through. The only other time that somebody has had to do that was the Liberal Democrats. Yes. And people were absolutely furious when they weren't able yes. to do that. Well, isn't it funny? I mean, I was talking to Norman Baker just a little bit earlier, who was in that sort of Lib Dem coalition government. Um, and I said, well, you know, nobody called you a fantasy economist when you said, as, as Lib Dems did, that they will give free social care to every, everybody in Britain, which is clearly not in any way sustainable. You couldn't source enough money to do that. And he said, oh, yeah, no, it's been fully costed. And this is now becoming the most annoying phrase for me in this election. It's been fully costed. Um, and, and you just go, you, they're just trotting that out now, aren't they? I mean, the expression fully costed, I think, comes uh, with the formation of the Office for Budgetary, Budgetary Responsibility. Yeah. And all it means is basically we've decided that within the parameters of no growth that this country has set itself, we can do this thing, which means that it'll have next to no impact and it'll cost very little and we'll have to scale it back anyway. Because, you know, we're, we're no longer really a functioning democracy. We're a bureaucracy that decides how much you can and can't spend um, and then says to the parties, well, go on, off you go, have some fun with that. Mm. Um, it's yeah, that aspect of it. It must said is, is tremendously frustrating but i think reform sort of two core messages one that we can get immigration down yes i think most people recognize that even if that's not to net zero as they say you can do an awful lot to bring it down from the hundreds of thousands per year that it currently is and the other one that i think is the, the kind of the core message that they've been leading on it's it's the one that interests me more raise lots of poorer people out of tax by raising the tax threshold to twenty thousand. Yeah. And those are two things that you look at and think, OK, even if those headline numbers are a bit fantastical, those are two things you could absolutely do. And most people would expect a government that was on the side of the poor, so both Labour and the Conservatives, frankly, would be able to say, yeah, no, we should be able to achieve that. And yet, frankly, the Conservatives have... Uh, betrayed those people and the Labour Party aren't even b pretending to promise people those things. No, I mean Labour Party's promises are quite vague aren't they? I mean there's still a lot of work that needs to be done I would suspect on people sort of looking into what it is they say they're going to do. They've talked a lot about the first hundred days of government but they're sort of wary of being too certain about getting in because there's always a chance that these polls could be way off isn't there? Oh, there is. And I do, in this country especially, I do always hesitate when I see the Conservative numbers because I think, do you know what, actually when it comes to polling day, mm. a lot of people will pause and they'll think, do I really want Labour in? Because I think with that message that if you vote reform, you'll get Labour. It's not cutting through for everybody, but there are some people for whom, you know, they'll look at the numbers in their own seats and they'll yeah. think, oh, I'm not quite sure. Um, so we'll have to wait and see. You know, the, the portents of apocalypse of 60 seats for the Conservatives, I still think that would be exceptional and extraordinary yeah. if that were to happen. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think we, we have to wait. And of course, there is always, always the possibility uh, that Sir Keir Starmer might let something slip. He might give you an accurate number. He might mm. tell you exactly what he plans to do. <laughs> it will, a bit like with Theresa May and the public might go, oh, hang on a second, I don't like the sound of that. Yeah. Well, Wes Street almost sort of let the cat out of the bag on Sunday when he was being interviewed in various morning rounds when he kind of said well, there's a lot more that we want to do uh, when it comes to raising taxes. And, you know, what you've seen so far isn't really going to be just what we do. Well, exactly. And I mean, this is also part of the problem with the idea that they might get a giant majority, is that they kind of stay silent now. And then the second they get in, because they've got the mm. numbers, wow, we can go hell for leather. We can absolutely put up anything we want because we've got five years of this stuff. Although, is that really who Sir Keir Starmer is? Again, we're not entirely sure. I mean, there are people like Peter Hitchens who say that he is a very ideological and he's sort of a yeah. wolf in 
clothing and that we all need to be very careful. I suspect, as with anybody who becomes Labour leader, there is an element of truth to that. Mm. Um, and, and that he might become incredibly radical and do a lot of things that are very unpopular from very early on. The other thing, though, is that a lot of Labour MPs might look at the sort of the paucity of their support, recognise that they're not you know, universally loved. They have been elected because they weren't the Conservatives. Yeah. And think to themselves, well, I don't want to push this electorate too far because actually I quite like being an MP. I don't like the idea of losing my seat in five years' time, which, again, that'll be something that the Tories, uh, that the Labour Party will be looking at the whole time is thinking, OK, this majority is fantastic, but we could lose it every bit as quickly as the Conservatives did if we push the public too far. The taxes are already high. They're not especially enamoured with us anyway. It's entirely possible. Mm. And also, Keir Starmer gave a bit of a hint to his ideology, did he not, when he was up in Grimsby last week uh, at that sort of, you know, town hall debate, if you like, when he said that he would not pay to put one of his loved mem loved ones or members of his family through private health care uh, because he was opposed to it, which I think a lot of people found extraordinary, even those people who know that, you know, OK, you won't believe in the NHS and all of that, but surely to God, if one of your family was in need of medical treatment, surely uh, you would do that. But let's have a look at Rishi Sunak, um, who was talking yesterday about the situation with the polls. is the one on July 4th, and we are going to fight every day until that election. And it's important that we do, because if those polls were replicated at a general election, it would mean handing Labour and Keir Starmer a blank check, a blank check to do whatever he wanted, put up everyone's taxes completely unchecked with no one to stand up to them. Yeah, well, I mean, he sort of, be careful what you wish for, I suppose you would say there, wouldn't you? I think so. And I mean, it's very nice of uh, Rishi Sunak to point out how our system works. Yes. Um, <laughs> but how also, useless his campaign is. Yeah, and also how we all have to be careful. That's the thing. We right. will have to be careful not to vote the wrong way in case we let Labour in. And everybody's kind of sat there going, well, hang on, no, it's you mm. that's this. It's you that's letting right. Labour in. Because we've got to a point now where the average Conservative voter genuinely looks at the two of you and goes, is there much difference between between you and Sir Keir Starmer? The taxes are already yeah, high. Right. There are absolutely no Conservative policies ever get uh, seen through. We get a little frisson of them. You hint at maybe you'll deport a few hundred people to a third country, mm. but it never actually happens. So, you know, I, I, it's all very well and good, uh, Rishi Sunak, saying these things. But honestly, after this length of time, and having experienced, as you say, having experienced quite how bad his campaign is... Mm. Um, I think, honestly, just the less said from him, the better is probably the the best electoral strategy. I think so, yeah. And, I mean, you may w wish to join me. with Some some good news for Rishi Sunak this morning, front page of The Sun, uh, exclusive by Harry Cole. They've sent a second migrant to Rwanda. Um, to be fair, he has also paid £3,000. I was wondering earlier if he's going to meet up with the other guy uh, and they're going to sort of have a bit of a mini party. There's there's a BBC documentary coming to that, isn't there? Or, or you know, so a drama of the two of them. Right. They found a ship in Rwanda on a deportation flight. I mean, it, that's wonderful. I hope I, I wish him well right. because he's something that's not going to happen to very many other people, is it? It really isn't. Well, I said at this rate, 120,000 uh, when you got two going in, I think it's about three or four months. I mean, I haven't got a calculator that adds up to that, to that number, <laughs> but it sounds to me like quite a few hundred years. I think your odds are better to try to come to the UK and risk being sent to, deep, uh, the, to Rwanda than even staying in France. You're more likely to be deported if you stay anywhere else in Europe. And of course, that's the major part of how this deterrent doesn't work. If your odds are actually better, if you try and cross the channel um, of not being deported, yeah. um, then you're obviously going to try and take that route. And of course, Labour aren't going to do very much. This new border control thing, yeah. uh, what is that meant to be? It's not going to change anything. Well, they're basically renaming the border force and making it sound a bit more sort of hard hitting the border command or something like that which really uh, is a bit like sort of you know uh, changing the color of your car when everyone's got any wheels on it well i was going to say they're going to give them new jackets they'll get then maybe they'll get a new helicopter maybe we can find the money for that sort of thing so that we can watch the people coming over the channel uh, and do nothing about that there won't be any new processing centers there won't be probably uh, no no new agreements with countries uh, to deport people even though of course legally those countries are already obligated to take their citizens anyway yes. we've got idea that we have to have returns agreements with them you know there are exceptions afghanistan obviously but actually countries like india countries like jamaica uh, th there is no legal recourse for mm. them to say no thank you we're not going to take our own citizens if you fly them here ourselves but try telling that to a british government for whom the default exactly. mode is 
can't do that. Well, this is it. I mean, the problem as well, you're right to say, well, if, if people in Afghanistan do have a right to come here if they were helping the British Army uh, while they were in Afghanistan. But the trouble is, we mm. don't know whether they were or not because nobody's got any record of it because it was all left behind when it was all everybody hurriedly left Afghanistan. So, I mean, you might well be somebody who helped the British government or you might not. But as long as you say you did, uh, you're probably going to be OK. Let's have a quick look at uh, Keir Starmer talking about the other big story today, uh, which is the voting age being lowered to 16. Yes, I want to see 16 and 17 year olds voting. They can go out and work. Uh, they can serve in our armed forces. And of course, if they are out and working, they pay tax. Um, and therefore they should have a say over how the money they're paying in is being used. So yes, I want to see that vote for 16 and 17 year olds. If you can work, if you can pay tax, if you can serve in your armed forces, uh, then you ought to be able to vote. I haven't encountered any members of the public who think this is a good idea. I mean, I remember what I was like as a 16-year-old. I was a complete weapon. Some people <laughs> might say that I'm not much better now, but I wouldn't have given me the vote. Um, I, honestly, I, I think that this is... We all know what this is. They think it's because the trend is that young people will vote left-wing and that they'll be able to sort of lock the Tories out yeah. indefinitely. If only they can weaponise this entire vote. But I, it really is a be careful what you wish for situation mm. because... The European elections that we've just seen sort of sweep right-wing parties to power. One of the major, most interesting trends is the support, rise in support from yeah. far right and hard right parties amongst the 16 to 30 demographic in yeah. Germany. The AFD it has doubled in less than a year. It's a, it's a, it's about 20. It's it's near uh, homing in. Sorry, on about 20 percent of of their support. Right. So these. Do not stay static your whole time. The Labour Party want to pursue this sort of idiot, uh, idiotic policy. Of course, we're, we're about to give them the mandate to do so. But honestly, I really, I, it, it just exasperates me, the fact that this, yeah. is, this is the first thing, one of the first things that they're talking about doing. Absolutely. It really doesn't make much sense at all. Thank you very much indeed. Good to talk to you. Better expense there with his take on uh, the big political stories of the day, including, of course, uh, what it is uh, that 16-year-olds know about voting. A couple